Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from pastors here at the Rock. Father, thank you this morning that we have the opportunity to gather in a nation that is free. Lord, you said first pray for kings and those that are over authority. So Lord, we lift up our country to you this morning, first and foremost. It's so on my heart, Lord, that we would be a nation that exalts righteousness and that sin is so distasteful to our nation, Lord, that we would run from it. Father, we lift up the churches in the Inland Empire to you that you'd bless them today. We love the house of God and we thank you, Father, for a nation that allows us to gather and to worship publicly and freely. Father, grow your church, grow your community, grow the kingdom of God in this place. And Father, as we open the word of God today, open our hearts, open our eyes, open our ears. Holy Spirit, come, be free. You're the revelator and the teacher of the church. Mighty Spirit of God, we welcome you in this place. And we thank you for the living word, Jesus himself. Come and bring what belongs to him and bring it to us that we may work his works in this hour. In Jesus' mighty name, and we all said amen. amen. Turn around, give somebody a high five on the way down. There you go. I am Mrs. Cobre. I love that name, Mrs. Cobre. We just celebrated our 33rd wedding anniversary on Friday. Yeah. Four kids, 11 grandkids. It's been, a, it's been a journey, an amazing journey. And this morning, my assignment is to bring you, we're going to give you three points. And last week, Jim taught us about what God had spoken to him for 2012 for The Rock, the year of the shout. And as you can see, our signs in 2011, everything was silenced as far as outside activities, conferences, guest speakers, mission trips, everything was canceled. And God said, I want you to take a Sabbath rest. And there was a pruning that went on. And, and yet in that year of silence, you can see in the shout, I don't know if you can read it or not, all the things that God did just in us as a local body, no guest speakers, just services. And it was a wonderful year of rest. But then this year, God has said, now it's time that you've been pruned and you've rested. It's time for growth. And so he said, this is the year of the shout. This is the year where you are to shout my praises, shout my name, shout my glory, shout what the rock is doing all over into the highways and byways. And so he told us that we were to shout. And there's three reasons he gave us. Now, he could preach on this for probably the whole year. But there were three main things, and they all started with C. Do you remember? The first one was shout over our commitment. That we have something to shout about. That we've, we are born of the Spirit of God, bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh, and that we are his children. And to shout of the vow and the commitment that we have to the Lord Jesus Christ. He wears us, we wear him. Then he said, shout about your church. As they laid the foundation of the, of the temple in the Old Testament, they shouted as they saw that God was rebuilding the house and that the local body of Christ, now there's great churches everywhere. We are one of many. But God has called us to shout about this house, this family. The church is his body, the church is his temple, and the church is his family. And so we are the local house of God here at the Rock. And God said, I want you to shout your family name and to shout in billboards and everywhere you can what I am doing here in your own local house and in your family. Shout about your church. And then the last thing, the last C was the city. God said, shout about the city. And he gave us the example of Jericho. And when they shouted, the walls came down. And God says, shout because I've given you the city. I have many people in this city. And God loves this city. And he loves the Inland Empire and Yucaipa and Redlands and and Rialto and Colton and Riverside and Fontana and Beaumont and Banning and, and Grand Terrace and all the cities of the Inland Empire, our local community said, shout over your city. Shout the victory that you have over this city. Satan didn't pay the price for these cities. Jesus paid the price for these cities. Shout for I've given you the city. And so he said, this week we're going to tell you how to shout. And so that's what this is about. And my assignment is point one. And so we're going to give you three points today, as well as a DVD on the, on, the, on the church that you can hand out and some cards that Jim will explain in just a little bit. But my assignment is part one. And so the first point, and this is the point that I'm bringing in the next few moments, is number one, this is a God assignment. How do we shout? Well, I got to know that this is a God assignment. This is a God assignment. This is a God assignment. 
to shout, to tell. And we started this church 23 and a half years ago. We'll be 24 years old in June. And these are things that we learned and that I learned as a pastor's wife, sitting as, as one of you in the pew, just listening to my husband preach. And in Matthew chapter 28, and if I could have that up on the overhead, Jesus' last words to his disciples were, and Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. These are his last days on the earth before he, he leaves. And the Holy Spirit comes. He says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. I love that. We know his authority is in heaven, but now it's on the earth. When he said it's finished and he took the keys of death and hell, it was finished. And Satan no longer had any authority to put people in bondage if they didn't want to be and they wanted out. All authority has been given to me on earth. And then the next part of this verse says, go ye therefore. Go therefore. In other words, this is a mandate. It's not a suggestion. Go therefore into all the world. And make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go. Jesus mandated that you and I would go into all the world and make disciples and tell the story and shout his praise, make his name famous, and do what he told us to do because he has the authority and he's delegated it to us. In Ephesians chapter 1, I don't have this on the overhead, but it says in the last verses of Ephesians chapter 1 that he is the head, we are the body. That in him all the fullness of the Godhead dwells and that we are in him so that as he is the head and we are the body, we are his legs, his mouth, his eyes, his feet. We are everything he is and that he was on this earth. That's what you and I are. I learned that we are all full-time ministers of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter if you're a doctor, if you're a nurse, if you're a janitor, if you're a waitress. It doesn't matter if you're a mechanic. It doesn't matter what kind of costume you put on when you go to work every day. You and I are full-time ministers of Jesus Christ. I learned that. I learned that this was a mandate. This was a God assignment on my life, and it's a God assignment on your life. And if I don't realize that this is not a suggestion, but this is a mandate, I'll never go. I will never go, and I won't know how to go or what to do. Now, I just said to you that you're full-time ministers of Jesus Christ. God's put in the body five-fold ministry gifts. The apostle, first and foremost, the prophet. Then he talks about the evangelist. Then he talks about the pastor and the teacher in Ephesians chapter 4. The fivefold ministry gifts are there in the body of Christ, in the local church, to strengthen the church, the body of Christ, so that you can go out those doors during the week in your everyday lives and you can preach the gospel. St. Francis of Assisi in the 14th century made a brilliant statement, and you've heard it many times probably. Maybe you didn't know he's the one that coined it. He said, preach the gospel everywhere and at all costs. And if necessary, open your mouth. In other words, I'm to go and my life goes before anything else. My life speaks loudly of who I am and what I do, my actions and how I live my life. But there's also a time when we need to go and we need to tell and we need to shout the message. And I had to learn that. I had to learn that this wasn't God's suggestion. This wasn't God's idea. This was God's command and mandate on my life. There's a reason why I'm here. There's a reason why you're not beamed up and I'm not beamed up as soon as we get saved and we're in heaven. God is on the earth through us bringing the message and the demonstration of the kingdom of God everywhere we go. And guess what? There's thousands of people in this auditorium. If he multiplies his anointing and his ability on thousands, can you imagine the thousands and thousands that will be touched as you go out with the kingdom of God and the anointing of God and the spirit of God and the grace of God and the faith of God on your lives and you go into the highways and byways and you compel them to come in. You're going to reach far more people people than Jim will ever reach or I'll ever reach. God is into growth. He wants people. That's the first thing I learned. And along with that, I learned that God hates empty seats. He hates empty seats more than I hate empty seats. Now, I've been a pastor's wife for, gosh, 32 years. 32 years I have sat in church and I have sat service after service and either listened to my husband preach or someone else. So I know what it's like to sit in a church service. Do you ever get bored just sitting? I do. Do you ever get bored just around Christians? 
You should. Not bored. Maybe that's the wrong word. Unchallenged. Unchallenged. Because we love to be around each other. Mutual faith, iron sharpens iron. That's the wrong word. But as I just lived in the body of Christ as the pastor's wife, I realized that I wasn't challenged. I needed some good sinners in my life. And God showed me that he hated empty seats more than I did. Because you see, in our lives, every time a sanctuary fills up, then Jim multiplies a service and has another one. So I've always seen empty seats. And I realize that that's God's plan, to multiply the kingdom of God because he hates empty seats and he wants his house full. And there is a banquet in our future. It's called the wedding supper of the lamb. And he doesn't want one empty seat in that banquet. And I'll prove it to you, Luke chapter 14, and then I'll let Jim speak. But I'm still doing pretty good on time. So let's go. These are things I had to learn. One generation shall declare his works to the next. Luke chapter 14, get there while I'm speaking to you. We're old now. Jim's 67, I'm 62 this year. We are grandparents now. Our job now is to impart, to cheerlead, and to set you up so that you are successful in your lives. We've had our stories. We've had our revelation, and we'll have new. I mean, God's not finished with us. There's fruit that God promises to old people. We'll never stop bearing fruit. But what I want to say is, these were things I learned 23 and a half years ago. These are my stories. But you, 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 my children and my grandchildren, you have your own stories. You have your own stories to live. You have your own verses to come alive into your lives. You have your own doors to knock on and your own ministries to start. And your own testimonies that I'll, I'll never live, but you will. And your children after you if the Lord tarries. And so this generation must find this revelation on your own. And it needs to be fresh and new in you. And 23 and a half years ago, God showed me how much he hated empty seats. He taught me that I fly over the mission field to get to the mission field. That there were right in my city people that he wanted in my church that I was missing as I was longing to go to Africa and to the nations of the earth. God said, you're flying over your mission field, and it is your mission field. Your city is your church. Everyone that's in your city is potentially a member of your church and going to be ready for the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he showed me this in Luke chapter 14. And Jesus is preaching, and one man says, blessed are those who have who sup with you in the banquet of God. And he, he answers him with a parable. And a parable is an earthly story with a spiritual meaning. And verse 16 said, a certain man gave a great supper and invited many. So he's responding to that comment. And he sent a servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, come, for all things are now ready. But they with all one accord began to make excuses. Now I'm speaking about empty seats. They with all, with one accord, began to make excuses. The first said to him, I've bought a piece of ground and I must go and see it. I asked to have me excused. The other said, I bought a five yoke of oxen and I'm going to test them. And I asked to have me excused. Another said, I have married and therefore I cannot come. So there were investments. There were relationships. There was work. There was all these excuses in this parable. And they said, we're too busy. We can't come. And the servant comes back to the master and he tells him what happened. In verse 21, so the servant came and reported these things to the master, and the master, being angry, he was furious, said to the servant, go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in here the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind. And the servant said, master, it's done as you commanded, and still there's room. The master said to the servant, go into the highways and the hedges, the places where nobody wants to go, the places that are hidden, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those men who were invited shall taste my supper. And I found out that God doesn't want empty seats, that there will be excuses of people that should be there, won't be there. But God says if they won't come, then you go into the streets, you go into your families, you go first to your friends, and you invite them to come in. And if they won't come because they're too busy, too distracted, and too busy with their own relationships, then you go into the highways, and you go to the places that nobody wants to go, and you compel them. You drag them in that my house may not be empty. He paid too high of a price for empty seats. And there's a roaring, heinous 
violent hell that is raging against our world. And if we do not stand up and shout the praises of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ and what he's done in our life and compel them. Now in the Message Bible, this verse is very well translated. In verse 22 it says, whoever you find, drag them in. I want my house full. That word compel means to drag. It means to bring in any way you can. If you got a hog, tie them, kicking and screaming and drag them into the house of God, you bring them here. In other words, you're going to be resistant, but you keep going and you keep going and you keep going and you keep going until they start to come. Now, here's the thing. So I'm to go. This is a mandate. It's a God assignment. This is our God assignment is point one. So a couple of thoughts about this. I had to learn to go and not be afraid because I didn't realize that I had a lot of prejudice inside of me. I'm sure I still do, and it'll be washed and washed and washed until I go to heaven. God's never done working with us. But I had to realize that I had to go in spite of my prejudice. And every single one of us in here have prejudice. We may not see it, but it's there. And it, it'll glare at us if we'll start going. Some of you are prejudiced right now because a woman's talking. But that's okay because God used a jackass to talk to a wayward prophet so he can sure use a woman. Some of you have color prejudice or age prejudice, size it doesn't matter what it is. We're different, and God's a God of diversity, and yet we seem to be very insecure when things are very different. And God had to teach me to go. You know, I remember the first time I knocked on a door and asked somebody if they wanted food, because that's how we filled the buses, is we had to go. So I went to Fifth Street. There I was with pimps, pimps and prostitutes and hoes and everything else. And here I was, this little white woman with three little kids, you know, and there I am knocking on a door. I was fluorescent. I'm so white. And you know what I found out? I found that behind those doors that I was afraid of, there were just people. Just people. Just trying to live. Just trying to live and just exist, really. When we asked them, do you want some food? And they said, yeah. Do you want us to pray for you? And they said, yeah. You want to come to church? We got a bus to pick you up. And they said, yeah. They started coming. And they started walking down the aisles. The lame, the maimed, the blind, the ones nobody wanted. The ones I was afraid of. The ones. See, fill up the house of God. We have a pastor on staff. His name is Pastor Mondo. He's in the children's ministry. Mondo was a gangbanger. He had a bullet in his back until a year and a half ago when it finally popped out. God just pulled it right out of his body. He's our children's pastor. What if somebody hadn't gone to Mondo? How about Sheila? She's head of our transportation ministry. Sheila had a crack house. She was a meth addict, and she made meth. She was in prison for four years. She got out of prison. She got a bill from the state of California for child support. Can you imagine? She went to the child support division. She said, I've been in prison. I can't pay this. They handed her a brochure, and they said, well, see, this church, it's got a Botech school. It's going to teach you how to drive a bus or drive a truck. Go there. At least you can get a job. She got her license, her commercial truck driving license from our school. She said, this is what she said. She said, well, I guess they taught me how to drive. I should at least go to one service. She went to one service and came down the aisles and gave her heart to the Lord. Today, she's head of our transportation ministry. Picking up over 22,000 people last year. What if she hadn't gone? What if we didn't have that? You see, there are ministries here. There are people right here in this, in this auditorium that God wants to speak to you on how to go. There are new adventures and new ministries and new revelations from this generation that God wants to bring to the rock. But if you don't know that this is a God assignment, it's not a suggestion. It's what we're here for, to tell the story. We won't go. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. Whew. Woman can preach. I love her preaching except at 2 o'clock in the morning. I don't I mean, uh, and believe me, she's as fired up at 2 in the morning as she is here. It's just Isaiah the prophet's sister. I'm just grateful that she's a whole lot better looking than Isaiah the prophet. You say, how do I know? Because I think she's the most beautiful woman in the world. That's how. Number one, this is a God assignment.
Bottom line, you don't want to do it. And you know it. Bottom line, you haven't been trained to do it. And you know it. Bottom line, you don't think you're smart enough or equipped enough. And you know it. Bottom line, you're like the rest of the American churches that make excuses. We're full of them all the time. We're not gifted enough. We're not intelligent enough. Let the preachers do that. And church in America has been designed so that you will come in, enjoy the speaker who tickles your ears. You will sing some songs that bring memories to your heart. And you will leave and call that church when in fact it's not. And somebody needs to love you enough and respect you enough and tell you that if God wants you to do this, he will equip you to do it. God would never ask you to do something, never, that he is not going to back through you to get the job done. He doesn't want to torture you. He doesn't want to put undue pressure on you. He doesn't want to ruin your life or make you feel bad about yourself. But you and I have got to get out of the mentality that this is for someone else. In Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verse number 11, it says these words. I'll just quote them to you. There's been gifts given unto you, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, apostles. These fivefold ministry gifts were given unto the church as a gift. They were given on for a reason. Here's the reason, which we've missed. Verse 12 comes along for the equipping of the saints. In other words, that you become equipped to do what God would have you to do. Because you are, what Deborah says, full-time ministers of God. Now watch this. Then the verse goes on and says, for the work of the ministry. This is not whether or not you can do it or not do it. It's not whether or not you're pretty enough or gifted enough or smart enough or ordained enough or been around church long enough. That's not the issue. The issue is the fact, and it's a fact, that God said, this is what I want you to do, and you are to do that. Whether you like it, feel like it, whether you want to or don't want to. That's a fact. So number one point, this is a mandate for all of us that are in here. If you're born of the Spirit of God, you have a job ahead of you. It's not just to complete your task here on earth. It's not here just to do your work. It's not here just to raise a family, have children, get an education, and have a retirement program. It's not to be a Republican or a Democrat in a free society. You are laborers of Jesus, and you are called by God to tell somebody in a lost and dying world of the goodness of God and without that mentality we fail right off the bat and all we do is church and think that's good enough when in fact it's not good enough now listen to me which brings us to point number two if point number one is this is a God assignment then in order to complete God assignment you're going to have to have point number two and point number two is this is a faith assignment. A faith assignment says, I don't know how to do it, but I know God will get in and help me. I don't know the ways to do it, but God will make a way. The Bible says all things are possible to him. Not some things. All things are possible to him who what? Believes. We've got to believe that God's going to get in. And we say, I don't know what to say. It's not what you say. It's what he says. Amen. Sometimes you can say something. Have you ever noticed? And people hear something else. And they will say, my goodness, I heard you say. And I'm going, I don't remember ever saying that. And they heard from God. 
And they will say, no, you said it. You said it. I say, I don't remember saying that at all. In other words, I've got to believe. I've got to have faith. I've got to know that God's going to get involved with this with me. That I am not alone. And listen, I'm going all over the world this year and teaching pastors how to be pastors. Not churches, pastors. Thousands of pastors this year. I have no idea what to say. How would you like to go somewhere halfway around the world and speak to thousands of pastors and you have no idea what you're going to say if I don't have faith that God is going to show up and speak to the people? I couldn't go. And it's exactly the same thing with you. Let me walk over here for just a moment. This is Daphne. Daphne is ahead of our our um, d deaf community. Now listen, listen. If you've watched Daphne over the years, she's phenomenal. She does great. Do you know why she's in that chair doing what she's doing? Because she heard me say something to her. I remember her coming to the door saying, Pastor, you said for me to do this and this and this. To tell you the truth, I don't even remember her coming to church. <laughs> I don't remember saying a word. You see, my point is, it's not what I say, it's what they hear from God. <laughs> that changes people. And you have got to have faith in this. You've got to have faith that God's going to back you. Go with me to John, the fourth chapter. The woman at the well. Jesus is with his disciples. They're on their way to Galilee and they stop in the land of Samaria, which is not a Jewish land. There, Jesus sends his disciples off into the city to get food. He's there alone and he parks his weary body, if you will, by Jacob's well where there's water. He sits down, don't think for a moment, he doesn't know what's going to take place. He sits and waits while a woman comes to the well. She starts to draw water from the well. He speaks to her, which shocks this woman. When God speaks to you, it will shock your life. It'll disrupt your plan for existence and your plan for the day. He is speaking to her and she says, wait a minute, you're speaking to me, you being a Jew. I'm a Samaritan, we don't talk back and forth. What is this all about? He says, give me some water. She says, how can I give you water? You don't have anything to get the water out of the well with. He said, if you knew who asked you for water, you would ask for water from me and I would give you water that you would never thirst again. She stops and she thinks about it. She says, I want that water where I'll never thirst again. And then he goes and he starts to tell her of her past. That she had five husbands. And the one she's with right now is not her husband. She is shocked. She is stunned. And then he goes and does something most unusual. He says, I am the Messiah. I am the Christ. The one you have heard of. And she is blown away by all of this. The fascinating thing is she becomes, if you will, the first evangelical outreach. The first evangelist. She's an amazing lady. Let's take a look at it. John 4th chapter. I'm going to start in verse 28. After she hears about Jesus being the Messiah, meets up with him and hears his words. Oh, 
She does something in verse 28. And the woman then left the water pot and went her way into the city and said to the men, we always concentrate in leaving and going to the men in the city. We never concentrate on a little thing. She left her water pot. What in the world does that mean? And why would something as simple as she left her water pot be important to you and I today? A water pot which most people don't understand, was the source of life for them. Every day she would walk to the well. Every day she would draw water out from the well. Every day she would take lentil out for lentil and fill that water pot up. A water pot had to be made in such a way that it would hold and strengthen during the pressure of everything from the well to her house. And that day, if she didn't do that every single day, she would not have water for her family. It was a very valuable item. You did not leave your water pot just around. In those days, your water pot would be claimed by someone someone else, ripped off by someone else. In other words, let's put it in terms that you and I could understand if you just had a moment. Listen closely to this because it's important. It would be like an automobile to you today. It had that kind of a value. You would not just go leave your automobile somewhere without someone coming along eventually and taking your automobile. It's how valuable the water pot was, but she had had an encounter with God and immediately she leaves everything of importance to do what she knows to do, which is to go to a city and tell somebody about Jesus. The problem with American church is we don't leave what we know to, uh, uh, that is valuable to us, and we don't go do what we're supposed to be doing. And my friends, God is changing that at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. She leaves her pot and she goes into the city. Immediately she gets up and she's gone. Verse number 29, come and see, she says, he uh, who all, uh, tell, told, all, told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Can I stop and ask you something? Did he tell her all things that she ever did? No. She only heard about her five men that she slept with and the one that was with her that wasn't her husband. So what is she saying? She has obviously heard something different even than what Jesus was saying. And the illustration here is that when you open your mouth, you've got to have faith to believe that they're going to hear what God wants them to hear. They're going to see into an area that they can, only they can see in with God. They're going to understand something only they can understand. You don't need to see it. You don't need to understand it. You don't even need to speak it. You just need to say something and God will get in there and do the rest. And that's what happened with her. Verse number 30 comes along. And they went out of the city and came to him. They would have never come out of the city and gone to Jesus if there hadn't been somebody who heard and believed and went and spoke. You have heard, you have believed. Now we need to go and we need to speak. And every one of us that are in here, it's a mandate from God that's going to take faith. Why? Because you don't want to do it. Why? Because you don't feel you're qualified. You don't feel you can. You just want to go to church. You do not want to be bothered. You have been trained for 250 years not to be bothered. Just go to church, sing a few songs, listen to some preacher, go home thinking that's good enough. It is not good enough. And God's called you to be the instruments of the voice that's going to carry. And unless you have faith, it's never going to happen. Let's continue in the word of the Lord. Here comes his disciples and they urge him to eat something. Verse number 32. And he says to them, I have food to eat in which you do not know. Therefore the disciples said to one another, has anybody brought him anything to eat? <laughs> Verse number 34, and Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work, which ought to be the cry of every one of our hearts. Listen to me. If you ever had a mantra in your life, reason for living, something you want to live your life by that has greater value than anything else, 
Jesus says these words. My food is due to the will of him who sent me. God sending you. And to finish. Did you know that you're the finishing agents of the work? Mm -hmm. And to finish his work. Did you know that you are the finishing agents of his work? The next verse comes in. Verse number 35. Jesus starts to speak to his disciples. Do you not say that there are still four months and there comes the harvest? Behold, I say, you lift up your eyes and look at the fields, uh, for they are already white for the harvest. In other words, he says, do you not say that there's a... Did you hear them say anything? Did you read anywhere where they said, eat something, the harvest isn't for four more months? Do you read that anywhere? I'm sure his disciples are saying one to another, did you say something about the harvest to him? No, dude, man, I didn't say anything. I don't know what he's talking about. I was just eating over here. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, he starts to talk about, don't say that the harvest is four months off. You know what he just said when it comes to reaching people? Stop making excuses. Open your eyes and see that today is the day. Wait a minute, we're all full of excuses and you know it. I'm not smart enough. I don't know how to do this. Let me tell you something. One woman came in here, a sinner woman. I remember her. She walked up to the church service in the morning, got saved. I remember the tears running down her eyes. I remember her getting saved. We met her right after church service in the first time visitors area. Then she came back the next week. She told me this story. She says, I got saved in the morning. I brought 14 of my family members that night and they all all God saved. Did she have to go to Bible school to do it? Did she have to have a bunch of verses to do it? Did she have to know what to say to do it? She didn't know what she was doing. She had no idea. Man, she had no concept of what the scripture had to say. She just opened her mouth. They heard what they needed to hear. They got into a place where they could get right with God. We're talking about shouting a shout. We're talking about having faith to shout it. We're talking about, yes, you don't know how to do it. No, there's no doubt about it. you don't want to do this. There's no doubt about it. You've been geared and trained over the years to do nothing. But all of a sudden, guess what? God's putting a mandate on every single one of us. There's a job we've got ahead of us. We are the full-time ministers of Jesus Christ. Now, point number one is that this is our God assignment. Can't get away from it. Point number two. That this is a faith assignment. And point number three is this is a grace assignment. That grace is going to empower the assignment. You got to trust in grace. We have a little saying around this so we can understand grace together. Some of you know it. You ought to say it out loud with me. It goes like this. Grace, God's sovereign divine ability to get the job done on our behalf when we can't do it. Let me tell you something. Only a few of you have said that. The rest of you must not know it. So therefore, listen closely to what I'm just said. It says these words. God's sovereign divine ability to get the job done on my behalf when I can't do it. In other words, grace comes in where I fall short and picks up the difference and makes the job get done. That's what grace is all about. I love the way Deborah says grace. God's power in me to do what God's word demands of me. Grace. I got to know that God's grace. Here's this guy. His name is Paul. The most unlikely man to be one of the greatest disciples and apostles of Jesus Christ since the birth and resurrection of Jesus. Writer of two-thirds of the New Testament. The only one that had a time period called grace that introduced grace to the church. Peter didn't. James didn't. John, who walked with Jesus, didn't. Only Paul understood the depth of grace. Here's what Paul writes about his life. 1 Corinthians, 10th chapter, verse 15. Pop it up on the overhead. Verse, chapter 15, verse 10, I'm sorry. 1 Corinthians 15, 10. 
It says, but by grace of God, I am what I am. Stop right there. If you're the full-time ministers of God, it's by the grace of God you'll be the full-time ministers of God. Faith in what God has called you to do and his grace that makes it happen. It's grace that takes you beyond yourself. It's grace that takes you someplace you don't know where to go and say what you don't know what to say. It's grace that helps you to accomplish what needs to be accomplished that you have no ability and no insight, even no desire to finish and do. It's grace that makes it happen. And Paul writes about his life. He says, I am what I am by his grace towards me was not in vain. Did you know that he also makes a statement there that the grace of God towards you and me could be in vain if we don't respond with an attitude of knowing this is God, put faith to it, and allow grace to work in it? More abundantly, he says these words. He says, but I labored. And I highlight this. There means there's something you got to do. A lot of people say, it's the grace of God will make it happen. I don't have to do anything. Wrong. You got to put in your labor. You'll show your faith by your works. Are you following me? A lot of people say, well, I got faith. I don't have to work. I want you to know something. You need to read your Bible. <laughs> and he makes this statement, I labored. What does that mean? He got in and put himself in a place where he didn't want to go. Think he wanted to be shipwrecked? Do you think he wanted to be snake bit? Do you think he wanted to be beaten? Do you think he wanted to be in prison? How would you like to be in a prison and yet have the mandate to reach the world with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and you're in prison? He never had a concept that today, thousands of years later, we would be talking the words that he pinned while he was in prison. you got to be kidding me. I labored more abundantly than they all. Who's the they all? Have you ever thought about who the they all they are? I labored abundantly more than they all. Peter? James? John? The other disciples? Well, when I read my Bible and I see Paul in prison for years in Jerusalem, I don't see Peter coming to his rescue. He was there. I don't see James, the head of the Jerusalem church. Peter, Paul is in prison. I don't see James coming after him, sticking up for him. I don't see John, you know, the sweetheart John. I don't see him coming and fighting for, for Paul's freedom in prison. Let me tell you something about all of us. We are all human beings that make mistakes. But if we'll just believe God, at whatever level you believe God, is whatever level God will use you. And Paul labored among more than all. But the, not me, he comes along and he says, but the grace of God was with me. In other words, we got to have an understanding that you being a witness to a lost and dying world is not a suggestion. It is not a hope from Pastor Jim and Pastor Deborah. It is not a message that I preach that you evaluate and decide whether to do it or not to do it. There is no decision on your part if you are a Christian. It's a mandate from God, number one. Number two, you got to have faith that if God called you to do it, he'll back you. And sometimes you're going to have to leave your water pots to get into the cities. Three, you got to know that grace is what empowers you to make this work. Today, I know where you're at. You kind of wish you went to Calvary Chapel <laughs> or Emmanuel Baptist or one of the other great churches in the area. Today, you came here. And today, Pastor Jim is in your face. Because this is about the people. This is about the people that are in your life. My God, they need help. And you're the instrument 
that God wants to use to help them out of the pit of hell. Today, you ought to give the Lord a great big praise. Let me conclude. I'm, I'm really over, but let me conclude this. The way you show God love is sacrifice. Love has always been described as personal self-sacrifice, the giving of oneself for the betterment of someone else. When you sacrifice doing something you do not want to do, you're saying to God, God, I love you. When you go to church and you don't want to go to church and you sacrifice your feelings to do what is right, you're now saying, God, I love you. He hears that greater than ever. When you sacrifice something, if you're fasting and you're saying, I'm sacrificing this food because I want God to know I love him. Jesus went to the cross and sacrificed to show you his love. You do not want to be the witnesses that God's requiring us to be. But when you get out of yourself and you sacrifice, then here's what it means. You're making a real statement, not just with cheap words, but with your life. God, I love you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only be sacrifice. No greater love than he that gives his life for another. Sacrifice. And that's what this is going to take. I'm not expecting you to be excited about this. I'm just expecting you to recognize you can't get away from it. And you can run off to other churches, but this message will burn in your heart for the rest of your life. And let me just say this to you. If you hang around this place, get ready for an adventure of your life. It's going to be great. Come on, somebody. Give the Lord a great big shout. Woo! I want to make sure everybody's all right. I don't have much time today. I usually go through an altar call that explains where you're really at. Today, I'm not going to do that. Today, I'm just going to ask you. You hear me now. Listen, before you leave, don't leave this place and go to hell. In order for you to get to heaven, you must be born again. Hear me. You need to get born again. Born again means you need to give God all of your heart and give God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus. Giving God all of your heart and all of your life. That's what this is all about. Jesus said these words, you must, in order to have eternal life, you must be born again which means you're going to have to give. He won't steal, won't take it from you. He could have made robots by the tens of thousands, but he didn't. By the millions and trillions that all worship him, but he didn't. He gave you a free will choice. The day is this. Will you choose to give God all of your heart? Will you choose to give God all of your life? Without that, you're not saved and you're not going to make it to heaven. Because you can't get there on your good looks or your education or being a nice, good, per friendly person. You're going to have to give God all of your heart and give God. And you know it's you I'm talking to. You know it's you. Stop messing around with God. You know it's you. In a moment, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go like this. One, two, three. And I'm going to pop my hands. Bang! When you hear that sound, bang! Your hand, now don't mess with God any longer, is your day. God brought you here for a reason. To give him all of your heart, give him all of your life. He says, if you confess me before men, I'm a man, I'll see it. He says, I'll confess you before my father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you, Jesus says. Well, sit there like this when you know you need to get right with God. Today is your day. All across this auditorium, I'm not going to mess with you. I'm just going to tell you, today you know you need to give God all of your heart, and you know it. Now, are you going to do something about it or just sit back? It's your time to give God your heart and your life.
I'm going to count to three. Who should raise their hand? If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. You've never given him all of your heart, I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your life, I'm speaking to you. If you're one of those people that are in here and you're not sure, make sure today I'm speaking to you. All across this auditorium today is your day of salvation. I'm, I'm counting. This is it. You sit there and just stare at me if you want. But someday you will stand before God and I'm going to tell you something you want to hear. Well done, good and faithful servant. Come into the joy of the Lord. You do not want to hear, go from you, worker of iniquity. I know you not. Those are the wrong words. And I'm telling you, your whole destiny is on a hinge for this moment. Today is your day. I'm counting to three. Here it is. I'm done. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Thank you. Eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifty. Thank you. Sixteen. Thank you. Seventeen. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else? There's 17 wise people already. Anybody else? Thank you. There's 18. God bless you. Go ahead. You can put your hands down. I count you guys back there. Might be one extra back there, but I, I think I count all of you. A, a, 18 wise people. Where are you, 19? Where are you, 20? Thank you. There's 19. God bless you. Where are you, 20? You need to, you need to get your hand up and let's go for God. Come on. Thank you. Up on top, there's 20. God bless you. Let's give the Lord a great big praise. Now here's what I want you to do. All 20 of you, don't mess with me now. Don't mess with God. You say you're going to give God all of your heart, all of your life. All 20 of you, get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend. I want you to get your stuff. I want you to check everybody else. Check with your neighbor. Make sure they're okay. Say, neighbor, come on. I'll go with you if you need to. Check with your neighbor. And I want you to get out of your seat, all 20 of you, and anybody that should have raised your hand but you didn't, get in the aisle and meet me right here in front. No one leaves during this period of time. That's rude. Don't be rude. Let the people come. If you raise your hand you're serious about God, get out of your seat. Get up here right now. Come on. Lord, I give you my heart. Come on. I give you my soul. Come on. And I live. breath that I take, every moment I'm awake, Lord, have your way Come on home. Lord, Get out of your seat. Come you on home. Heart. I give you my soul. And I'll Thank God you guys have come. Thank God, thank God, thank God. Everybody up here, congratulations. Now listen, you don't get saved by just walking up front. That's cool. This guy over here, look to your left. See him waving at you? His name is Pastor Dave. Good guy. No weird stuff goes on, I promise you. He's going to lead you in a prayer. He's going to give you some free information. And he's going to tell you about a program we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers. That's simple. That's simple. And let you come right back out. People you came with, they'll wait for you. Only takes a few moments. Please make a left turn. Follow Pastor Dave right over there. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise.